I talked to various people yesterday about the topic of my talk. And as a result, I've been awake half the night rewriting, redoing my slides, changing the order and changing the contents. Uh, the result is probably going to be a, a bit more chaotic than usual. Anyone who knows me I'm, knows I'm always chaotic. Um, but I'd like to just start with a question. I discovered yesterday that some people th uh, think that if you make a mathematical discovery, for instance, if you find a, a proof in Euclidean geometry or something, uh, that's not an example of having a conscious phenomenal experience. Uh, does everyone here agree with that? So does anyone think it is an example of having a conscious phenomenal experience? Yeah. Well, OK, so more agree than don't. Um, well, perhaps yesterday I wasn't communicating, but uh, I, thought, I thought it was a, a, a perfectly good example. And um, I was going to talk about the experiences that ancient mathematicians had when they made discoveries in Euclidean geometry. And not only ancient mathematicians, but um, some toddlers, so let's try and see if this video works. Now this is a child aged about um, 17 and a half months and I just happened to be in a position to detect, to, to see that she was going to do something interesting. She had been scribbling on the sheet of paper, as we can see in the corner, with pencil and then crawled along, found this other sheet of paper lying on the carpet picked it up, got onto her knees, and I just got out in time my rather grotty old video camera. And um, if I can just start this, I won't go through the whole thing. Um, this is online, and if you uh, video, uh, Google Sloman Toddler Pencil, you'll find at least what, it's on YouTube and on my website. Anyway, she... Um, uh, picked this paper up which had a hole and she stuck the pencil through the hole. Then she pulled it out and did four things in parallel. Very, there they happened very quickly and I'll stop in a minute and say what the four things were. Okay, you've now seen them. Uh, and if I had a longer talk, I'd do it all in slow motion, but let's just stop this now. Um, she, after putting the pencil through the hole, she pulled it out, and as you saw, moved it up and round, and at the same time changed its orientation while she was turning the paper over to, so she could see the other side, and moving her head and the, her, the positions of her eyes. Um, then she brought the pencil down and it came into her field of view so she could check the details of the, because she, I don't think she'd have been able to uh, get it through the whole blind, but all she had to do was get it close to the hole, then she could see she had all these rich qualia um, and could use them to coordinate her actions. And she pushed it through and then pulled it out and then came back and stuck it through the original side and then put it down. Now, there's not a robot on this planet that can do that. Uh, as I suspect if there is, it'll need months and months and months of training. Um, but I want to make a few points about what you're doing. One was that she noticed that possibility very quickly. She be, and I have no reason to believe she'd been practicing previously with doing that sort of thing. Obviously, she'd been practicing putting other things through holes. Uh, at that age, they do a lot of that with modern toys. Um, I think she formulated a conjecture in three-dimensional topology that there is a continuous route from the configuration where the pencil goes through the hole in that direction to the configuration where the pencil goes through the same hole in the opposite direction. And that continuous route not only exists, but she was able to find that there are many of them that exist. She's able to construct an example of that class of roots and use it to get the pencil point. Now, that's an example of evolution's achievement in producing consciousness. Just one example. And, uh, well, the title of my talk was going to be Why Current AI and Neuroscience Fail to Replicate or Explain Ancient Forms of Spatial Reasoning and Mathematical Consciousness. And I could add also toddler consciousness and, and, and topological reasoning. And I have 
dozens and dozens of examples, and I, I'll, I'll go through a few more, but I want to switch up and down between levels of examples and general points. So if I um, just scroll down a bit. Uh, this is a picture of what Jackie Chappell, who's a biologist at uh, uh, Birmingham University, who, with whom I've worked intermittently since about 2005, we call that the meta-configured genome. The idea is that for a, a number of species, not all, humans in particular and, and probably other intelligent animals, the genes that are available at birth are not all expressed in building structures at birth. Some of them are, sorry, even before birth, soon after conception, there are things that, while the baby's in the, in the womb, there are genes that start building all kinds of things, and initially it's just a few cells, and then more cells, and more cells, and more cells. And then you begin to get the shape of a, of a body and so on. And a whole lot of uh, genomes Ha, 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 or, or mechanism, genetic mechanisms, have by the time of birth, have produced quite a lot of not only physical stuff, physical apparatus, bones and blood and neurons and all kinds of things, but also information processing competences. And uh, some of these are not, not easy to observe. For example, very soon after birth, if a nipple or something vaguely like it is put in a child's mouth, it'll start sucking. Not every child succeeds and so on. Um, th this is um, quite difficult for a child to do because it's got to get an airtight seal between the, the lips and uh, the sort of skin. And you can see the difference between a newborn baby given a rubber teat with a bottle of milk where it's very easy for the child to latch on and, and start sucking and given an animal one and it's much more difficult. So that's where uh, child starts learning all sorts of things, I think, about geometry and space and muscular control if it's got a sufficiently difficult task. Um, and uh, again, I, I don't know if there are any robots that are able to suck milk out of a thing <laughs> at the moment, but there are all sorts of things that go on inside the mouth that, which require uh, complex control systems. Anyway, that's so. There are things that produce simple behaviors. They interact with the environment. In this case, it's, it's the environment in the mouth. And various things happen. There's feedback and successes and failures. And information comes into the system. And the idea is that, uh, the, that this sort of process causes changes in some collection of information about what's been learned so far. And at a later stage, more sophisticated genes uh, get expressed with more complicated competences, which build on top of and combine these simpler things. They also interact with the environment, and information is gained about that, and so on. And then later still, after many layers, you'll get meta competences where th there are things that are not only producing behaviors, but reflecting on the processes by which the behaviors are produced through internal uh, uh, options, decision-making, and so on. And uh, I don't know how long that continues, but some of those genes obviously wait until puberty. Uh, the ones that control the processes of uh, reproduction. Um, and they change all sorts of things, including what you're interested in and, and how you physiologically react to things you're interested in, and so on. So there isn't just one thing from the beginning, and then it learns. And any model that assumes that is going to be wrong biologically. It may be interesting for a future robot. It might even be able to achieve it. But that, it's not going to explain what happens in humans. Now, there's a lot more to be said about this, including the fact that it's very sketchy, very incomplete. It was partly inspired by many of the facts about language development, which some of you will know and some not, but I'm not going to talk about them now. The stages of language development uh, were partly what inspired this. So I'll move on. And I want to talk about these two gentlemen. Some of you will recognize their faces. This guy is David Hume, and that's Immanuel Kant. And David Hume famously said there are just two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge that you have just because of the relationships between your ideas. In modern terms, we could say we have uh, definitions, and we have logic, and we can derive things from uh, logic, uh, from our definition using logic. For example, we have a definition of a bachelor in this, in this culture uh, 
bachelor is an adult male unmarried man. And um, we, we also have definitions of uncle and so on. So if you think a little while and I ask you, can a bachelor uncle be an only child? You'll produce an answer. I'm not going to spoil your fun by telling you the answer. Can a bachelor uncle be an only child? But you work it out and you'll understand what I think you meant by relations between ideas, but it's a slightly complicated one, uh, as opposed to all bachelors are unmarried, which is much simpler. Anyway, uh, then he, there are other kinds of knowledge where you can't just use your relations between ideas. You go to, you've got to go out and look. You've got to do experiments, see what happens, uh, try that umpteen times. Uh, and you can never be perfectly sure that when you let go, it will never go up that way. But at least you can come to a conclusion it's highly unlikely. You get probabilities, high probabilities from experiments. So that's his second kind of knowledge. And he famously said, if someone claims to know something that isn't one of those two kinds, then it's nothing but sophistry and illusion committed to the flames. And I think he was thinking of theology and, and a lot of metaphysics when he wrote all that. He, anyway, Immanuel Kant read all this and, and like, was suitably impressed, as, as many people were and should be, and said, hmm, there's something he's left out. He said Hume woke him from his dogmatic slumber. And Kant introduced a richer ontology of types of knowledge, which some of you will know about, some not, um, in which he said that he accepted Hume's distinction between the relation between ideas and the things that are not relations between ideas, and he called that analytic and synthetic, and each can, they can be made more precise, but there isn't time now today. And he also uh, accepted that there's a difference between things that you can discover just by thinking, using the relation between ideas, and the things that you have to discover by investigating the world, doing empirical research, having experiences, and so on. Um, but he also pointed out there's a third distinction between you can just, the things you can discover, which if they're true or necessarily true, they have to be like that. If they're false, they cannot be true, they're impossible. And then in between, and apart from that, there are things that are contingent. They, they may or may not be true, it depends on how the world is. Uh, the, the population of the planet at the moment is, I think, un, human population is under 20 billion. But uh, whether it'll ever reach 20 billion is an empirical question. It, it, it may be that there's an argument to say it's impossible, but I don't know. Anyway, point is, Kant thought that mathematical discoveries, uh, some mathematical discoveries, came on the synthetic side that Hume was talking about, not just arrival from logic. They were not empirical. You didn't have to go out and do things uh, like measuring and weighing and so on. You could think about them and work things out. Uh, and there are lots of problems about the different ways of doing that. One is using logic, um, but not if it's synthetic. Uh, then logic's not enough. Uh, logic and definition is not enough if it's synthetic. So it's the stuff that's synthetic, say, all right. But also that what you can discover uh, in the, some cases when you do empirical research is contingent. You discover that something is true. It could have been false. You discover that something is false, but it could have been true. It could be one or the other. But you may also find that some things are necessarily true or necessarily false. So, for example, some of you may... How many people studied Euclidean geometry at school, just out of curiosity? Uh, that's a good proportion for this country. I know you're not all from this country. But at the moment, the educational system is appalling now, and many people go through school without ever having the experience of finding a proof or, or thinking up a construction and proving that it does what it's meant to do in Euclidean geometry. And as a result, their brains are deficient for life. Um, and um, Anyway, Kant had studied Euclidean geometry and he had examples like if you have a plane surface, you can draw straight lines on them. And if you draw enough straight lines, you can enclose a finite space on your plane surface. This is one of his examples. What's the minimum number of lines you need? Can you do it with one line? You can't enclose a finite space because you just do one line. Then if the plane goes off infinitely in both directions, on both sides it'll be infinite. What happens if you have just two lines? Can you enclose a finite space? Some people are smiling at it. 
Anyone think it, you can enclose a finite space with two lines? No, good. You need a minimum of three. And that's one of his ex many examples. And when you make that discovery, it's not at all clear what your brain is doing. And nothing I've uh, heard from psychologists or neuroscientists uh, explain to me what a brain is doing when that discovery is made. Uh, we can generalize it. How many plane surfaces do you need to enclose a finite three-dimensional volume? That's fun for you in your spare thought time. OK. so. Kant is saying there are lots of examples, and he chose some of his examples from um, uh, geometry, some from arithmetic, um, uh, some from topology, and ordering relationships. He had quite a lot of examples. And I'm saying he was right about all of those having the character that, that, that he described as being uh, knowledge that is synthetic, um, non-empirical, and it's about something that's necessary. This is necessarily true or necessarily false. But he had no explanation of what, how it worked. And furthermore, he said in one of, one of the paragraphs that got translated into English, says something like this, this may be an art that lies forever concealed in the depths of the human soul. In other words, he really thought it was hard to explain how this kind of stuff could work. Um, I suspect if he'd lived a couple of hundred years later, he'd have taken up artificial intelligence and started trying to learn how to program robots to do things. And he might have come up with ideas about uh, how to uh, produce a robot that could do what, what, what he was talking about, make those discoveries. Which is what happened to me in 1969. I'd written a thesis in 19. 62, defending Kant against the then popular view that Kant had been refuted by Einstein and Eddington because they had shown, well, Einstein came with the notion of space being a non-Euclidean structure and Eddington observing the eclipse of the, of the sun which show, made it possible to measure the displacement of the direction to a, a, a star that was visible close to the line of sight of the sun. You wouldn't be able to see it without an eclipse. Compare its position relative to the other stars during the eclipse and photographs, not during the eclipse, but at night. You see a slight displacement confirming what Einstein had predicted. There are some doubts about Eddington's experiment, but never mind that. The point is it was thought, we now know space is non-Euclidean, therefore Kant is wrong. Forget about him, unfortunately. Well, there's all the rest of geometry. <laughs> Apart from the fact that, that it's Euclidean, uh, and there's all the topological relationships and so on. Thanks for the reminder. I'm, I'm going to have to stop far short of what I've got uh, planned, uh, prepared. Um, so I thought, well, uh, in my thesis, I, I gave a partial defense of Kant, uh, including the point I've just made. Uh, but I didn't know how to, how to produce a mechanism that could explain it. And when I started learning about AI, I thought, maybe I'll find out how to produce a mechanism. And I um, got into AI, I learned to program, I, I was very lucky. I, I wrote a paper criticizing logicist AI and got invited to uh, spend a year in Edinburgh, which was then one of the four or five AI, major AI centers. I met a lot of very bright people, including a young student called Jeff Hinton, um, whom I disagreed with, but we got on very well. Um, uh, he even worked with me later, but we still disagreed. But <laughs> we got on very well. Anyway. Um, I learned to program, and years and years later, I still don't know, know, know how to produce a working model of what that baby does or what I think Kant said we can do when we do Euclidean geometry. And uh, by being asked to write a comment on Turing's 1952 paper for the Turing centenary, then there was an Elsevier volume um, which was made up of a collection of sections. We were in each section, there were writings by Turing. And then there were short papers commenting on those papers by Turing and so on. And by a mistake, I was asked to comment on Turing's paper on the chemical basis of morphogenesis. Has anyone here read it? OK, a few people. Know. It's now, in recent years, it's the most highly cited paper. He's talking about chemicals diffusing through a 2D space, and then when they inter meet, they interact in various ways. Quite a lot of mathematics. It's a long paper. It's complicated. I haven't taken all the maths. But the question that I asked was, why the hell was he doing that then? 
And I then remembered that there's a sentence in the 1950 paper, the one where he introduces the um, imitation game, the thing mislabeled a Turing test. My time is up and I'm going to have to stop very soon, but I'll finish this sentence. Um, so I, I came to the conclusion that if Turing had lived long, there's that sentence in that paper, the 50 paper, which says, in brains, chemistry is at least as important as um, uh, electricity. Sorry, my <laughs> brain's going soft. Chemistry, but he didn't say why. It's one sentence, totally strange. And I thought maybe he had a hunch that if he um, went on a bit longer, he'd be able to show something about chemical forms of information processing. And I later discovered only last year that he had in his thesis written that there are two kinds of mathematical processes that are different. One is uh, mathematical intuition and the other is mathematical ingenuity. And he said computers are capable of mathematical ingenuity but not mathematical intuition. But he didn't say what he meant by those. This was published in 1938. It's all online. If you can't find it, email me, Aaron Sloman, I'll send you links. And so my hunch was that if he'd lived on, he would have been trying to say something about that distinction and what kinds of mechanisms could support the mathematical intuition. But there's no concrete evidence that he did want to do it. Anyway, I haven't yet done it. I think it's very difficult. I hope someone cleverer than I am, inspired by thinking about these things, will come up some, with some new idea for building a, an information processing mechanism, which is a realistic model of how animal brains, not all animal brains, but certainly squirrels and primates and elephants and so on, uh, do their spatial reasoning because if they just do it empirically, learning things by experience, and they'll fail too often, especially the ones who live in treetops and do a lot of fast moving trees. They have to work out what's impossible, what cannot, what cannot succeed, and, that, and not empirically, they have to work it out. So um, I have lots of examples, lots of things online, lots of elaborations of everything I've said, but I have to stop now. Thank you very much.